Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Welcome back to the Project Endure Podcast. It is episode 12, and I have a very special guest down in Texas, Chris Gonzalez. Chris, how are you, man? I'm doing great, Joe, and there is nobody who I'd rather wake up at four in the morning, except for this guy right here, a very good human being. You know what, man? I appreciate it. It means a lot. And yeah, it's it's Saturday morning. It's currently 7 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Central, and you've already got a workout in. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, not to get too philosophical here, but over in in El Paso, which is a part of Texas that a lot of people, I guess, just don't. Uh, realize or something there's just something about this place you just kind of wake up and the mountains are everywhere but going back to working out early um I keep my circle really close and when it comes to self-discipline it's more about the self part and I judge my friends really hard because when they don't have that self-discipline I look at them a little bit differently because I know there's a lot more in them and I don't know. That just kind of keeps me accountable in the morning. I kind of see a lot of my friends waking up, cycling, my things, lifting weights. And it's kind of just a good way for me to set conditions for the rest of my day, to be 100% honest with you. I'm not a morning person by trade, but that's just kind of how I get myself wired up in the morning. Yeah, you and I share that in common. I, I am a morning person just by nature, but I do see the morning as a great way to set the tone for the day ahead. And so I'm sure we can dive pretty deep into all that kind of stuff. But why don't we rewind it and just uh, start with an introduction? So, you know, Chris, for the people listening, if they don't know anything about you, how would you introduce yourself to them? (laughs) Yeah, if it's not football or memes, well, let me get a little (laughs) bit more serious about that. So, hey, guys, my name's Chris. Uh, I guess full name's Christopher, if you would ever want to call me that. I am from the good old eastern shore of Maryland, a place called Salisbury. Very small. You probably never heard of it. Uh, finishing up my contract as an active duty Army officer, um, certified personal trainer through American Council on Exercise, um, certified CSCS, uh, certified strength conditioning specialist, former top 10 power lifter at uh, 145 kilos back in the day. R- I wrestled a little bit, um, love drinking coffee. I was a big, big country boy growing up. We're talking about like riding horses, uh, doing the sport. I forgot, I forgot what the name of it. Cause it's so, oh yeah. Noodling. It's where you kind of go. It's, you kind of go into the swamp, you kind of reach your hand down in the, uh, down to the abyss and you pull out catfish. That's how, uh, <laughs> that's how quote unquote redneck you would find me. And you probably want to know if you met me, but I, I love doing that type of stuff, but a uh, friend, brother, Christian. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of titles I like to label myself, but I know I don't like to take life too seriously. Yeah, uh, man, I I didn't know that about you. I also didn't know that noodling was an activity that had a name. I've seen videos of people catching catfish that way, but what's the biggest catfish you've caught uh, noodling? Oh, man, Um, I think I pulled one out that was almost like, they do it by inches. I I don't even know like how many pounds it was, but for a 13-year-old, it was pretty impressive. I think it was almost like five pounds. But then I stopped doing it because I saw like the person went ahead of me. He reached down and uh, he found a beaver and he wasn't happy. He wasn't very happy that he was being disturbed from his uh, little resting place. Yikes. Dangerous stuff. Well, you know, Chris, I know a little bit about your story and I know you've personally been through some hard things in life. And so I want to kind of jump right in and just ask the first question and see where it takes us. And so that first question is, what is the hardest circumstance that you've ever had to handle? Or in other words, what's the hardest thing that life has thrown at you that you haven't had a choice in? Um, I think the hardest thing that I've ever, and not to be too, cl- not to be too cliche with what I'm about to say, but I think the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with is just accepting my existence in on this planet. And what I mean by that is that I'm a little bit desensitized compared to the average human being on what they've experienced. You know, I literally kind of grew up without both parents in the picture for most of the parts. And 
I don't know, just kind of seeing other people kind of going up to the age. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe this is acceptable. And then, you know, kind of growing up borderline poverty level. And I feel like my first, I feel like my first real glimpse was when I went to college in Marshall University in West Virginia. You know, I kind of joined a fraternity. It was working two jobs. You know, every, every, everybody was walking around with the fancy boat shoes and the fancy clothes. And I was just lucky to be able to eat dinner that night because I worked three jobs at a very sketchy gas station that was getting shot up. But hey, they were, they were giving me extra money. So honestly, I think the hardest thing that I'm still doing today is just kind of accepting where I come from and kind of working out of that. I mean, as, cli as cliche as it sounds, I'm just now realizing that what I'm still that what I'm experiencing is not the norm and I would like to change that in one day. Yeah. If you could dig a little bit deeper into it, Chris, where where did you come from? When you say that phrase, what does that mean to you? Yeah. So just kind of growing up, I was kind of grew up in a borderline project in Salisbury, Maryland. You know, I never up to up to today and I wish I would do this more often. You know, I would never play the minority card ever because I'm like, oh, everything's fine. Um, everything's okay, you know, maybe this will all just go away one day. And, uh, yeah, growing up, I kind of want to say compared to most kids in elementary school, I was functionally, I was functionally illiterate, stuttering all the time. Like I would hate to pick up books. I would get C's in my classes. Cause like, Oh, Chris, did you read your book today? I'm like, no, I was too busy. Uh, you know, just playing video games and, you know, just hearing all the kids, what they did this weekend while I was doing absolutely nothing because I was a sheltered kid that couldn't afford much. Um, yeah, so grew up small, uh, small town America. I think my first real taste of freedom is when I got my first car and I moved to college and first college party. And I'm like, okay, this isn't me at all. And, and then, uh, yeah, so then I kind of wrestled in college. Uh, collegiate sports kind of kept me away from a lot of bad things. Told me a lot of structure. Um, I want to say up to college. I I want to say up to college, which is kind of I don't want to say kind of embarrassing to say because I look back at it now. It's I kind of became an adult finally in college. You know, I stopped stuttering. I stopped being nervous. I started reading. Stopped doing all these things, and then I kind of realized I'm like, okay, so nobody's e immune to the world's problems, but you can definitely change it. And then kind of going on to the active duty army side, I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't want to do this forever, but I, I'm going to have to become a different person altogether if I want my son, my grandson to kind of like not experience ever. Cause I look back at my family tree, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like divorces here. My grandparents always talk to me about, they lived in the time of the Jim Crow laws. And yeah, my last name is Gonzalez, but I am also half black as well, just for a little bit of context. So I'm like, wow, I have a lot of calamity going on in uh, my family tree. So on active duty, I would leave my platoon of logistic warriors <laughs> during the day. Then I became a full stack web developer at night. I did everything from do freelancing websites for people. Um, take, uh, take a lot of trips to Austin just to meet with big investors, kind of doing things that um, was like, wow, I would look on TV I would see that only like uh, Harvard trust fund babies would do this stuff. And now I'm doing these things. So now maybe I can create a new family tree that doesn't have to go through this poor demographic things. And, I, and that goes with, and that goes with everything. I'm learning more about human nutrition, something my family kind of struggled with because they do a lot of smoking and a lot of drinking. And I don't know to anybody listening, you know, if you start out at a, it's just the nature of the beast. If you start out with less, you're going to, you're going to have to find more in order to get to the place you want to be. And I don't think it's a bad thing that people need to look at where they come from. And I, I, I used to be ashamed of it, but now I know that if it's meant to be, it's going to be up to me. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the mantra that I use every day. If it's up to me, or sorry, say that if again, it's Chris. Meant, if, it's, if it's meant to be, then it's up to me. I uh, love that, man. 
And it's, it's interesting to hear your story and you kind of grew up one way. You had a, a season of life where you had this awareness that you didn't want it to be that way anymore, that there was an opportunity to change the legacy, to change the trajectory of your life and, and your family's life after you. And then you made a decision and you started taking action toward that. And I think that's such a common pattern in all of our lives where we live a certain way for a while. We have a moment or moments of awareness and then there's a decision. And that decision is where we could either push into the resistance and make the change, or we can just fall back to the easy path and keep doing what's always been done and live the life that we've always had. And so for you, what was the driving force deep down inside to make the change? Because it sounds like it's bigger than just you. And it's more about the people that are coming after you than it is about you right now. Yeah, um, I'm a big proponent. I am huge in my faith and I want to say that that's probably saved me from a lot of things and I am very you know I don't I don't have this verse readily available with me and I wish I did but the concept is God blesses he blesses generationally and you've seen this everywhere in the Bible and they're like oh why should I worry about it's kind of like when people kind of make the ignorant comments about global warming, which I'm still a little bit on the fence if it's at a such a degenerative rate because we, because you know I feel like the people's figures we should have been in a ball of fire by two, by <laughs> 2010, but let's not yeah let's not get into the, into that conversation. <laughs> but to you but to use that as context, people are like oh oh you know I'll be dead by the time global warming you know really affects. So it's kind of like that you you know so you just kind of see especially in the minority setting. You know, they're like, oh, you know, it's fine. I'm just going to work this job until I die and I get off of work and we're going to go tear it up. And I'm like, well, OK, when when are you going to get to the point where you're going to be thinking about somebody else? Because honestly, I think when you think about somebody else, it just kind of makes you better. I mean, for for uh, I mean, for example, it took a huge renaissance to finance because it's a quantifiable metric. And I'm a huge fan of quantifiable metrics, you know, just to measure life and how you're doing. But again, into that until a little bit later, I'm like, wow, this is cool. ETFs, REITs, all this other stuff. And I'm like, wow, once you get good at this, you know, you make enough money and you can pass it on to, you know, your son and all that. And I'm not a proponent of money, but, you know, it's a tool that kind of makes the world go around nowadays, unfortunately, especially with inflation. But uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, and also I think the big proponent is that when I was in West Virginia, I was kind of just hanging around a crowd with the people I just didn't really uh, resonate with. Um, part of a United States I recommend that nobody goes to. I'm, I'm just being, I'm just being 100% honest with you. I mean, they kind of have a fleeting population too, due to many factors. There, there's still a huge belief in um certain energy sources that we don't use anymore but that's besides that just kind of getting with the wrong people i thought getting out of maryland i was just gonna all of a sudden land into a good group just because i moved somewhere else but no you kind of have to cultivate and create that community and yeah that's something i just realized up to i don't know two years ago so um yeah so i just uh i guess just the driving factor is just one time i sat in church and that just kind of resonated with me and then i kind of took a mental inventory of like oh who do i hang out with what do i watch on tv and all this other good stuff and kind of just fell through up to today i mean i'm not saying i'm a finished project at all but at least at least i got my mind right to head in that direction i know it's going to take time just like any investment that you do uh, that's a good analogy. Uh, I love the stock market analogies, the investment analogies. And I think if you picture, you know, any chart of a successful company, just take Apple, for example, you look at the chart on a day to day basis. And I saw you post about something similar recently, a lot of ups and downs, peaks and valleys. And you might look at something on a day to day basis or even week to week. And you might, you might think that you're losing, uh, but then you zoom out and you trust the process. Now you look at months and years and you realize like, okay, we're actually, we're trending in the right direction. We're making progress. Then you zoom out further and you look at decades and you realize, wow, we are really on fire. And uh, I would love for you to speak to that a little bit because I think people can tend to underestimate what they can do in the long run and they overestimate what they could do in the short term. And that could lead to discouragement. So maybe talk to us a little bit about how you view progress over time, because I loved what you had put on social a few weeks back. Yeah, so days are turbulent, 
years are unpredictable. And I think the decades is going to reveal who's really been working. And I really love that. I, I really love that statement. And yeah, not to make this a financial piece, this is like the last thing I'm going to go into. But like we were saying, you know, like everybody's freaking out the day after Black Friday, which if you do, you do your homework, historically, that's always a bad day because of all the markdowns. But everybody's like, oh, Chris, your, ET, your long-term ETFs, they just took a nosedive. I'm like, yeah, guys, you zoom out a little bit. It's kind of like, like a curve. It goes down, it goes back up. In fact, that's the right time that you want to buy. But anyway, um, I view, you know, I view progress, you know, kind of like you're in the, in the gym. You got your micro cycles, you got your macro cycles. Focus on the micro cycles first. I feel like everybody's more worried about trying to correct the past result or trying to create a future vision, which is impossible. I'm practicing self awareness, just kind of being conscious in the moment, kind of not worrying about what other people to the left of my right are doing. Because, you know, if you can't focus on yourself, why are you going to focus on somebody else? And then once you just do those little micro patterns, you're going to look back in 10 years and you're going to be like, wow, all this built up, all these mistakes, it really kind of meant something at the, at the end of the day. So that's kind of how I view, that's kind of how I view progress, just little baby steps. I used to think, oh, I need to have objective A done by five years or 10 years or else I'm not going to be successful. Um, but no, yeah, if you think like that, you're just going to drive yourself mad. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, looking too far into the future sometimes could actually be detrimental because it could take us away from the moment, the present moment where we can actually do the work, where we can actually um, be, be aware of what's happening right now and intentional. And to your point a little bit earlier, just about our life and thinking about life as bigger than just us. I mean, I had a conversation with a friend, uh, Danny Jimenez, uh, who is actually on the podcast episode, which will be actually the previous episode. So if you're listening and you haven't heard Danny talk, I would highly recommend it. But, you know, we talked a little bit about the tombstone and it's something that he brought to my awareness is, you know, when somebody passes, they have a tombstone and they have the birth date, the death date, and then there's just a dash in the middle. And all these things that we're going through in life, right, they're all going to fall into that dash in the middle. And after our tombstone is set in place and and we're, you know, underground and then maybe somewhere else, depending on your belief system, right, the impact that we had on other people, that's the only thing that's going to last beyond us. And I think that's a really powerful way to look at it is, you know, everything here on earth is, is transient, it's temporary. We're only here for a short period of time. If you look at the big, big picture, but we can impact things far beyond when we're here. Uh, if we take that long-term perspective and we do things that are bigger than us and we pursue um, meaningful change that can impact generations. So just wanted to kind of throw that in there and, you know, ask you another question, Chris, which is similar, but a little bit different from the first, which is, you know, what is the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose and why have you done that thing? Well, I think hardest thing, I know hardest thing physically I think I've ever done so far was the uh, Baton Death March in White Sands, New uh, New Mexico. Oh man, my feet just kind of hurt just even thinking about that. So for just for a little bit of context to people listening, the Baton Death March was a very infamous event in World War II where uh, U.S. and Philippine soldiers were surrounded by the Japanese. You know, instead of giving up. They kind of fought to last man and the people that were left, they kind of did this very long death march over to a uh, prisoner of war camp um, all the way on the other side of the island where a lot of people died. And people kind of commemorate that event every single year. You know, you put you put what's called your rucksack on a very heavy backpack and you go this really hard course in White Sands, New Mexico, where it's so steep. At one point, I was on my hands and knees. It was, <laughs> it was really that bad. Um yeah, so that's the that's the hardest thing I've done. It's a ma- it's a marathon, except you got boots and you got a ruck on, and uh, yeah, probably gonna do it again this year. But uh, yeah, it it <laughs> doesn't get easier. Um, I think kind of going there. I know every time I've done this, I've done it three times already. Um, mile twelve, I think it's like the halfway point. You know, whenever I do these endurance events, I kind of go to that dark place for a little bit. Not not out of anything negative or anything cynical, but, you know, I kind of go into that dark place. I kind of 
see myself as that six-year-old and seven-year-old child again. And I'm just like, what am I doing to be, to be that person that, I, that, that little boy needed at that one point in time. And I think, you know, I'd see a, a lot of our friends do do a lot of crazy events and stuff. <laughs> I'm just like, I see, I see why they do it. It provides a lot of introspective. And uh, yeah, I think that's physically, um, that's the hardest thing I've done mentally. The hardest thing I've done maybe is uh, getting to the world of technology and uh, kind of startups and kind of talking to people. Um, I used to not be so, uh, I used to be not so adjourned to talking to people because I'm like, oh, you know, growing up, I didn't really have that good experience just kind of reaching out to people. Now I kind of realize, oh, not everybody is going to be against you in your best interest. Um, I think a, uh, I still, to this day, I still have trouble kind of, kind of when it comes to meeting somebody, I guess it's just a product from growing up. I'll give a really good example. I went to go watch the Rogue Invitational um yeah very good event it's like a crossfit style tournament event with some strong man sprinkled in there everybody in there is athletic even the huge dudes that can log press um the crossfit box that we were with they're all really nice people and they're like oh come up and watch us in our box and i'm sitting in the back of my head i'm like wow these guys just met me and they're being this friendly to me it's kind of hard to believe but you know i need to shake that stigma yeah, I think so. Uh, mentally, the hardest thing I've done is just being proactive in my in my education outside of work and just having the courage just to, you know, meet people and know that um, they're always going to have their best interests as long as you're just nice to people. And yeah, um, yeah, I think those are two very hard things. Those are great examples. I'd love to break them down one at a time. So let's let's start with with the march. You know, people can't see you on this podcast, but when you were describing, you said mile 12 is always the toughest mile and you were talking about a dark place. This huge smile just came across your face. And it was funny because you were you're talking about something that is, you know, theoretically painful and challenging and dark and this huge smile is on your face. And so, is there some kind of satisfaction for you that comes with being in that dark place and being able to access that person who can continue to dig through the really hard and dark times or you know is there any enjoyment in it for you at all oh yeah because it's it's pretty satisfying to know that you know your past is a it's a life lesson it doesn't have to be a a, it doesn't have to be a death sentence pretty much and just knowing that you're not that person anymore even though I'm venturing to say, you know, yeah, you, you, there's really not much you can do about being born into the circumstances that you're around. But no, yeah, I just kind of smiled because I know that I'm leaps and bounds uh, beyond. Like, I know going to this next stage of life, transitioning out the military, I know I'll not be the same person again from a social capital, economic capital, human capital, which I'm a huge proponent of. I have a lot of faith in people nowadays. Like, for example, waking up at 4 a.m. and working out just I was so excited about this podcast because I'm like, you know, I don't I haven't met Joe personally, but I can just tell just through through his actions and what he's doing. This is this probably going to be one of the most worthwhile things I'm going to do all all day because I have faith in people. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And like anybody that follows Joe, you know, he's kind of like if you've ever walked into Avengers HQ, you know, you kind of see him with the glasses on and like, you know, this guy's got the man with the plan. I feel like one day he's going to be like, Chris, I just found the cure for cancer. You know, <laughs> like, let's talk about it for 10 minutes. I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm excited. Just let me know when. But um, yeah, that just kind of leads into my points there. Uh, yeah. Being in your dark place, it doesn't always have to be like it is in the movies or uh yeah i mean i'm a big david goggins dude he kind of goes on the extreme ends about it but he's got a good point but you know it doesn't always have to be like this shouting match or something very sad you know you can look back and then you can even find you can even find the good places in dark places like oh i still had you know a roof under my head and water and food and i was watching some really good dragon ball z back in the day before they messed it up into into <laughs> what it is now, which I can't even explain. And uh, yeah, I mean, the dark place doesn't always have to be, you know, dark, cynically. You can look back and kind of see where you kind of dug yourself out of that. 
Oh, there's so much good stuff there. And I have to thank you for the compliments. Hey, compliments are one of the one of the things I'm not good at receiving. So I was blushing over here. But you know, there are, you know, <laughs> I don't even know where to start because there was so much good stuff there. But you at one point said that you're never going to be the same person again. And it, it made me think of this concept of we're dying to ourselves every single minute of every single day. So who I am in this sentence is not who I am right now in this sentence. And it couldn't be more true. And I think on that micro scale, it's really hard to see those changes or to appreciate the fact that we are changing like that. But we are, we're constantly changing and we're never the same. And with that comes a phrase from James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits. Uh, and I believe he said, every decision we make is a vote for the type of person we want to become. And so it's really this minute to minute, even second to second, changing that comes with the decisions we make. And there's so much power in that. And I think on a macro scale or a bigger, more tangible scale, you get to mile 12 and there's this decision that you have to make. Am I going to stop? Am I going to cave? Am I going to give in? Or am I going to continue crawling, continue climbing, continue walking toward the next best version of myself? And while that can happen on a big, more significant scale, like you were talking about, it also happens every single second to the people listening to this podcast. They're going to either decide, ah, they're, they're full of it, like that, that's not true. Or they're going to say like, hey, like, let me take this seriously and, and let me see what this is about. Because yeah, I realize that those small decisions every day are changing the person that I'm becoming. And it's really powerful. And then the other thing that really stuck out to me is you said, you can find the good places in the bad places. And it brings me back to this concept of and, not or. And I'm, I'm guilty of it. I talk quite often in terms of or or but. But when we talk in terms of and, we're really saying that two, two different things can exist at the same time. So you can be hurting and grateful. You can be uh, hungry and satisfied. You can be you know this and that. The world's not dichotomous. You can feel quote unquote, opposing emotions or opposing feelings or be in opposing circumstances uh, at the same time. And I think that attitude of gratitude is what I would call it, uh, is really, really powerful. And is that something that you've always had, Chris, that ability to see the good in the bad? Or is that something that you've developed over time through your experience? I would say it's something that I developed like over time, like pretty recently, I would say I'm, I'm 20, I'm 26 <laughs> right now. I kind of want to say when I, you know, first started joining the army, I had, had him to balance tech and working out and my day job is that's kind of where I really kind of found it. Okay. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit to what you said. All right. So doing the little things every, 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 every single day. And I'm a huge fan of what I said of quantifiable metrics, but unfortunately I think that our generation kind of, kind of focuses on the wrong one. So I'm going to dive into this just a little bit, guys, uh, guys, I feel like, especially the Gen Zers, we focus on the wrong ones, right? What are we focusing on? We're focused on, Oh, you know, he's wearing the shoes or he's got the followers on Instagram or any of that. I don't, I don't know how many people I've met that have a huge following that like, go, oh, what do you do outside of Instagram? It's like, Oh, I make videos for Instagram. And uh, that's about what my day is per, is proposed of. So, guys, I'm going to need you to focus really, really, really close here, right? What what are your quantifiable metrics? I know what mine are. Mine are new, minor nutrition, my or maybe my my uh, social impact, investing, you know, in certain goals that I like to reach. You know, focus on what's actually important to you. And going into that, you kind of need to know. Um, you kind of need to understand, you know, who you are. And that's a really hard statement, especially something that I kind of struggle with. What are, your, uh, what are your moral boundaries? What do you stand for? Uh, what do you think your obligations are? Or who do you want to be surrounded with? Because at the end of the day, that's kind of going to help you shape, you know, what you work towards. And it's going to make it easier, you know, kind of to say back up, step up and say no you know, when things aren't in your best interest. So I think kind of finding out quant your, what your quantifiable metrics are. And I think we kind of got it all kind of messed up here. You know, I've kind of been back and forth to central Texas and I've seen investors. I've given back millions to in, for, in philanthropy and they don't have Instagram. They're like, what's that? I was like, I've, <laughs> I'm more worried about, you know, getting funding to, underdeveloped minorities and all this other stuff, which I think is a great thing. That's something I want to get into one day, but I kind of, 
you know, it's scary. You know, I used to think that way too, until I kind of read into like the Amazon studies, you know, like people like, Oh, this woman had 3 million followers. We could help Amazon raise a hundred bucks for anything. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. I'm just saying you're probably working towards something that nobody sees. And it's pretty sad that self-discipline and even like things like human nutrition and goal settings kind of look down upon in society nowadays. I think a lot of people are, or they kind of have, a, you, and you kind of see this with COVID a lot. It kind of made people kind of look within themselves, you know, because they weren't allowed to go out and go party. And they're like, oh, you know, and I'll even say this right now. You know, a lot of people doubt me from where I came from. And I'm not saying that for anybody to feel bad. I mean, I was in a fraternity, but now you can see, you know, people aren't immune to people's problems. Like, I know my fraternity brothers, they're, they're doing stuff that they don't want to do right now because they did, they didn't want to put the work in and I'm not going to use names or anything. I'm just using this for context. There is a person that wanted to do broadcast journalism as a career. He didn't want to put work in now. Now, now he sells beer. I'm, I'm a, I'm a soldier first and foremost. Then I kind of like build, build websites and build architecture, kind of work out all my spare time. So I guess kind of to circle right back, you can be a completely different person than what you started out with. You know, life is a video game, you know, just don't get into much debt and, uh, you know, apply, apply yourself. And I didn't think I was going to be in here. I mean, tech used to scare me uh, like a lot. Like I know a few of my friends went to Harvard out of high school and it's kind of like the same thing. A lot of my friends that um, kind of did that stuff, you know, I had a family that grew up right up the street that didn't really judge me because they migrated from Pakistan. And I still talk to them nowadays. And I'm like, oh, his name's Hamza. I'm like, what are you up to, man? I was like, oh, I just graduated Stanford. Now I'm about to go make the metaverse better. I'm like, okay, you're the person that I knew from the fact that when we grew up, you were going to be somebody special. So keep doing that because I'm watching. We may not talk every single day, but I'm watching. So, yeah, so just kind of look out for those quantifiable metrics, guys. I and mean, then it's not really what it seems. You're doing – if you're if you're hitting those milestones 1% better every, every day, you're already doing more than the average American citizen is doing. So, yeah, that, yeah. That, that that's my little spiel right there. Yeah. That was a good one. And it made me think of a, an episode that I recorded for my other podcast, the pursuit podcast season two, episode 22, Kevin Shiera. He just real quick, uh, grew up in a town close to where I grew up in New Jersey. He's older than I am, but he was a professional wrestler for a while. Then he was a, a teacher in, I believe in elementary school, maybe middle school. Then he traded oil. And then in his forties, after he was almost, you know, in the hospital with, you know, heart failure, lung failure, kidney failure, he decided he was going to go to medical school and become a doctor. So at 48, uh, I just had a conversation with him. He just finished medical school. And he said to me, my life is just beginning. And it was amazing to me to look, look at his life. And in his mind, his life is just getting started right now. And he's already had four very different careers, done some really hard things. And I think we, we all sometimes feel like we get boxed into what, where we came from or what we started as. And you know, I'm another example. I started as a physical therapist. I went to three years of grad school to get a doctorate degree. And now physical therapy is a small, small fraction of what I do. And you know, maybe someday it won't be any of what I do. So I think to your point, Chris, yeah, we, we don't have to feel boxed in. And it's all about getting better a little bit at a time, making sure we understand what we want to improve, how we can measure that, what's important important to us and living from the inside out because I know Instagram is a place where you and I both spend some time and I, I my temptation is to let Instagram dictate how I live and to do things that are more for other people uh, and what other people might think than they are for myself and so I think one of my personal struggles and I'm speaking just from the heart here is doing things for myself first and then sharing them with the world not doing things to share with the world share with the world um, first, if that makes sense. Yeah, I totally agree. And to be 100% honest with you, you know, I just really don't know what to think about Instagram nowadays. I do think it's a good, it's a good resource for, I'm a huge visual spatial type of dude and Instagram does in the right niches has a lot of good infographics, for example, like, yeah, half of the investing platforms and like ETFs that I've used post COVID, I saw some very credible infographics on Instagram because it's pictures, right? 
at the end of the day, you know, when I was a kid, y'all you know, love picture books. Like, oh, it's the same thing. I was like, oh, then I researched this and I'm like, oh, this is a 10% per turn. This is the best thing ever. I didn't have to go read some book on Wall Street Journal. I found a picture and an infographic that broke down the, the percentages. So I think ever so going back to my last point, you know, that's the good of Instagram. I think the bad of Instagram, I think it's trying to teach people that you kind of need to blow a blow a trumpet for everyone. And, you know, I'm kind of bad with this sometimes, especially with uh, gym PRs, even though I feel like I'm I'm a little bit proud of that. You know, sometimes I could I could go a little bit OD in my personal pain, just kind of looking back. But I think in I think in society, we kind of have this little stigma that you need to stoop yourself down to be somebody that people can look up to. But no, you need to just keep being you, keep showing what your uniqueness is to the world. And then people are going to look up to that because it's you, right? And I see this a lot. Like, it just goes up. Oh, somebody looked on Instagram one day and this guy was wearing like, you know, these clothes. That means that I have to. And this guy ran this marathon that means that i have to and like this guy did this fancy investment or trying to do this social impact venture and now i have to do it because i have to but no yeah just be genuine and be who you are and i know people are working on at least i hope so or they're working on a whole lot of other things other than instagram that's just one that's just one platform i think it's powerful because it's pictures it's visual spatial so yeah, it, definitely. There's a lot of good there. And I think uh, if you find the right people to surround yourself with virtually and consume intentional content, it's a great place for personal growth and development and for learning. So, you know, with that being said, I want to shift gears a little bit. The title of this podcast is the Project Endure podcast. And so I want to talk about endurance. And so what I found through the first uh, 11 episodes of this podcast are that everybody has a different concept of what endurance is. And there's obviously a common thread throughout most of those. But if I were to ask you the question, Chris, what does the word endurance mean to you? What would you say? Oh man, does that have to get answered in one, in one word or? <laughs> nope. Give me as much as you got. All right, cool. I was like, wow, the pressure's on. Um, I think number one, endurance is finding yourself in a pair of unsatisfactory or unfavorable circumstances and just having the courage, grit, and discipline to kind of keep going. Um, I don't know who I keep hearing this quote from, but it's like, when you're going through hell, keep going because why would you stop? You know, you're going to be stuck in the middle of it and it's probably, and it's probably going to suck. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where I found, you know, it's kind of where I found myself experiencing like nowadays especially about to going back to being you know chris and not captain gonzalez anymore which is going to be a great feeling especially for my sleep schedule sometimes but no um yeah and when people get into that rut right and i feel like humans were meant to be together with other humans you don't have to brave this alone even in the bible you know man wasn't put on the planet by themselves you know people were meant to collaborate people were meant to kind of you know lock arms hold hands and kind of go through this trouble period so i guess going into what endurance to me endurance doesn't have to be something that you brave by yourself if, if you want to reach out to somebody and kind of share the pie and you know i'm a huge fan of sharing somebody else to suffer and do you know like call me at three or four you know just let me know the night before maybe but if it, if it <laughs> if it's an emergency you know i will definitely pick up the phone but yeah people are meant to be better together and um, yeah, that's what I think that endurance is, you know, kind of going through those unfavorable sets of hardships uh, together. And I noticed some of the most successful people spiritually from a happiness standpoint and those that give back, you know, they didn't come from a great set of circumstances. And you see this and you see this a lot. Like you look at Elon Musk and you look at Gary Vee, you notice they're a little bit older, right? And nobody really heard about these guys until recently. Well, yeah. Well, you kind of have Elon. He was telling us the stories in his 20s. He was coding websites in his basement and working, doing all this stuff. Now, you know, everybody thinks he's got like an e evil agenda. I think he's a, I think he's a good guy. He's working on stuff for renewable energy, Neuralink, trying to put chips in people that will help paraplegics. Like, no, I think he's a great guy. But yeah, just kind of circling back, going through those circumstances together and kind of building those communities. And I think COVID um taught us a lot about that the importance of 
obviously you can't be together in a pandemic too close because <laughs> that's kind of the point of it. But uh, yeah, just kind of, you know, we can do it through, obviously we're doing it through podcasting right now or just kind of picking up the phone. And I think the world will be a lot better place if we kind of just adopt that ideology. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I couldn't agree more. Let me talk to the Elon point first. I, <laughs> if anybody's friends with me on Facebook and you want to actually do this, go back and scroll to maybe 2012. And I made a post saying that Elon Musk was going to change the world and that he eventually would be Time Magazine's person of the year. I have no idea why I chose that metric, but uh, I really, I do believe in Elon Musk. I'm with you. And I think it's amazing uh, how far he pushes limits and how genuine and authentic he is to himself, even if that rubs people the wrong way sometimes. So that's one point. Two, uh, you touched on going further together with people. And it's something that Nick Bear talks quite a bit about. And I believe the origin of this phrase, it's an African proverb, but if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And it couldn't be more true. And I'm learning that more and more each day. And I think people sometimes imagine that that phrase has to be turned into a very tangible physical community. And it might be, it might be the people you're surrounding yourself with in a physical sense, but it can also be the people that you are communicating with and intentionally spending your time and energy with virtually, right? It could be on Instagram. It could be through a Facebook group. It could be through listening to conversations like this and spending time with people like you and me. And I know that that holds true for me, you know? I spend quite a bit of my time listening to podcasts. And even though I'm not actively part of that conversation, there is a piece of my mind that is conversing with those two people almost as if I'm sitting in that same room. And I think there's a lot of value in that. So, right, surrounding yourself with the right people. And then I want to rewind one more step to what you said about if you're going through hell, keep going. You know, why stop? There's this awesome quote by Earl Nightingale. And he once said, don't let the fear of the time it will take to accomplish something stand in the way of your doing it. The time will pass anyway. We might just as well put that passing time to the best possible use. And it's just this concept of, right, like time is, time is going to pass either way. And if you're in a place that you're not happy with, why stop there? You might as well keep going because time isn't going to wait for you. And the longer you stand still, the longer you're going to be stuck in that same place. And so I, I thought your definition of endurance was beautiful, Chris. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that before we move on to the last question, but I'll kind of throw it to you. Um, I mean, hmm. Yeah, I feel like endurance is something that we can go on for hours and hours about. So no, I I wouldn't say so. Just find that tribe of people and just don't worry so much about what what other people think about you. If they if they have time to do that, then they don't have anything worthwhile that they're up to then. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. And I would also add to that, I think Often we think that other people are thinking about us way more than they actually are. Oh, I am so I mean, bad at that. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad you touched on that. I am to this day, I am so bad at that. It's hard. I mean, just by you know nature, I think we're all pretty self-absorbed. We care a lot about ourselves and um, you know, take that for what it's worth. But I think when it comes to wondering what other people are thinking of us, more often than not, they're probably not thinking about you as much as you think they are. And so take that for, uh, you know, with a grain of salt, um, other, what other people think of you isn't as important as what you think of yourself. And so if you're truly happy and confident in who you are and who you're becoming and the values you stand for, um, keep doing you because uh, the right people will find you and the other people probably don't matter that much to you. So with that being said, Chris, I, I really value this last question because my hope is that people who are listening to this podcast um, can feel like the, uh, the guest, which is you in this case, is speaking directly to them. So for anybody on the other end of this podcast who's going through a really hard time right now, maybe it's a dark season of life, um, trials, tribulations, you name it, they're going through something tough and you're speaking directly to that one person right now. What would you say to that person who's in that tough spot, that dark place? Well, first three part thing. First, I'm going to, you know, sir or ma'am, find yourself. World's falling down 
the world's falling down around you before you do anything find yourself first then once you've done that find out what you stand for because then that's where everything's going to come into place the financials the theoreticals the skill set what you're going to be building to uh, to yourself every single day Fine. I mean, I feel like it's a blanket question and a lot of people still don't know what they stand for. And that's where you get concepts like wasted time and wasted opportunities. You can't be working on a million things and you can't be looking to the left or your right the whole the whole time, because then you're just going to get sensory overload. Then you're going to start gauging yourself, imposter syndrome, all these negative things. So find out where you come from. And then the last thing I would, I, w- I would say, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of how you started out because at the end of the day, you're, you're a whole lot stronger because of it. Uh, Cause imagine who you were. Uh, I imagine who you were going to be if you were just a spoon fed and individual that was protected and given everything. Uh, you wouldn't be as mentally or as physically strong if that's your thing. So I would say, find if if you feel lost find yourself find out what you stand for and never be ashamed of where you come from because it's going to be a beautiful story at the end of the day even if you don't see it now oh that is a good good answer and i appreciate you sharing that with the audience chris and so you know as we wrap up and you've got some cool things going on in your life uh people want to follow along connect with you just find out more about what you stand for and who you are Where's the best place for people to do that? If you just want to see, <laughs> if you just want to see, you know, random pictures of my life, you know, you can definitely follow me on Instagram. I'm, I'm actually a huge proponent of LinkedIn. Mm. Um, I think it's a platform that's very focused and a lot of people don't give enough credit to, but I think of a lot of the projects I've worked on and a lot of the other things, it's where you can connect with high profile people uh, without, you know, having to feel like there's any pressure on you. Like, uh, I know I'm moving to Houston soon. And um, because of that, there was one day where I went down to Houston and then I was finding myself eating dinner with the mayor talking about non nonprofits in technology in Houston, which is something I kind of want to do to give back. I'm like, this app is a lot. So if anybody has any questions on LinkedIn, just go on. Gary V talks about how LinkedIn is a business Facebook. So I suggest you kind of learn how that works and get, and get into it. It's a great way to find free mentorship and learn skills and find free resources and, and connect with like LinkedIn will censor out stuff that on Instagram that be considered, you know, not necessary. So I suggest <laughs> people get into it and, and it's only growing, but uh, yeah, um, like I said, I don't, I don't know what to think about on Instagram sometimes, but you know, I upload very frequently and, you know, just feel, just feel free to stop in and say hi if you want to. Yeah. There you have it. So Instagram for pictures, LinkedIn for business connection, growth, learning opportunities, and Facebook if you want memes and some yeah. football content every now Love and then. It. I appreciate your sense of humor always, Chris. I mean, every I feel, I feel like you're, you're always hitting the nail right on the head. Whatever you're posting about on Facebook always brings a smile to my face. And I don't know why, but I, I just appreciate your sense of humor. So um, there you have it, folks. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Um, I'm really, really appreciative of it. And I know the audience is too. So thanks. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. Oh, and one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.